which stand continually at the Duke's chamber to see who goes in and out. We cannot be too circumspect and careful in this regard. I am at this time transported with joy to see how happily all instruments and means, as well as lesser, cooperate unto our purposes. But to return unto the main fabric, our foundation is Arminianism. The Arminians and projectors, as it appears in the premises, affect mutation. This we second and enforce by probable arguments. That's taken by, uh, from Hidden Works of Darkness, page 89 and 19. For more about this, uh, please see the link uh, to an article entitled Arminianism, The Road to Rome. Uh, from this we can see quite clearly that the Jesuits believed that Arminianism was a drug that they had planted into Protestantism to undermine the uh, beliefs, which they call heresy, and that it will bear fruit in due season, and it's to undermine the Puritans, who held to, of course, the doctrines of grace. And, of course, uh, they even talk about undermining uh, the Duke of Buckingham, uh, so undermining the uh, the government, the, um, the, the constitutional system of, of England at the time. And this is f to affect mutation, so this is to, to, to alter Christianity uh, to, their, to their end. Now, if you're a Christian and you're watching this video and you've never even heard of Arminianism, it's likely that you are... Um, probably going to be an Arminian because, well, most Christians they actually are. So I'd invite you just to please uh, continue li listening uh, before you examine any of the links I'll post. Now the doctrines that Luther was defending uh, against the attack of the Papists, they are typically called Calvinism. Although like Charles Spurgeon, I don't really feel that this term is correct. Uh, these biblical concepts are often called the doctrines of grace. Now to quote Spurgeon, um, the doctrines of original sin, election, effectual calling, final perseverance, and all those great truths which are called Calvinism, though Calvin was not the author of them but simply an able writer and preacher upon the subject, are, I believe, the essential doctrines of the gospel that is in Jesus Christ. However, the Counter-Reformation was a success, and the doctrines that the Jesuits sought to undermine have all but disappeared here in the UK, where I live. When the doctrines of grace are preached, they are typically promulgated by false teachers in the US, mixing God's sovereignty with other teachings given them and invented by the Jesuits. Um, I can think of just as an example uh, John MacArthur. John MacArthur is upheld as some uh, great hero of what is called Calvinism. However the man, I mean by any observation appears to hold to futurism and dispensationalism. Don't worry if you're not familiar with those terms I will expound upon what they mean and show you exactly where they come from now. Now I've said that you will know the Jesuits by their fruits, but what of the fruits of Arminianism, which Lord said Arminianism, you know, said w that it would bear in, in due season? Before this is fully examined, we have to expose another doctrine held, again, by the vast majority of supposedly Protestant Christianity today. Now we'll look at um, futurism. I mentioned futurism. And I mentioned dispensationalism. Let's look at uh, the book of Revelation now. Let's look at eschatology, because this is very important in showing the, the uh, means and ends of the Jesuits, and just how powerful they have been in undermining Protestant Christianity. Now, like I said before, if you haven't heard of Arminianism, well, actually, it probably turns out that being a Christian today, you probably are an Arminian, and you had no idea. Similarly, you may very well go to a church that teaches some kind of futurism, 
I'll just expand on what I mean by that. There are typically four different ways of interpreting the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. The preterist view says that the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled in the past. Now this view is often held to by Romanists, the Papists, and uh, this was developed by a Jesuit priest named Louis de Alcazar. The second is as follows. Now, uh, I'm just going to quote extensively from Wikipedia here, as any good scholar would. But before I do so, I should point out that at the time of the Reformation, uh, for a few hundred years after, and indeed to many pre-Reformation reformers, it was entirely apparent that the papacy was the Antichrist. I'm not going to present an argument in this video for that here, yeah, but um, for more information on that, on how the view became apparent and whether it is so, please see the links in the description box. I very strongly recommend it, that you do research this and examine this and pray about that. Now back to Wiki and the second way of interpreting Revelation. The view of futurism, a product of the Counter-Reformation, was advanced beginning in the 16th century in response to the identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Francisco Ribera, remember that name, a Jesuit priest, developed this theory in In Sacrum Beati Ionis Asp Apostoli and Evangelistiae Apocalypsin Commentari. His 1585 treatise on the Apocalypse of John. And Saint Bellamine, remember that name as well, codified this view, giving in full the Catholic theory, theory sorry, set forth by the Greek and Latin fathers of a personal Antichrist to come just before the end of the world and to be accepted by the Jews and enthroned in the temple at Jerusalem thus endeavouring to dispose of the exposition which saw Antichrist in the Pope. Most premillennial dispensationalists now accept Bellarmine's interpretation in modified form. Widespread Protestant ident identification of the papacy as the Antichrist persisted in the USA until the early 1900s when the Schofield Reference Bible was published by Cyrus Schofield. This commentary promoted futurism, causing a decline in the Protestant identification of the papacy as Antichrist. Some US futurists hold that sometime prior to the expected return of Jesus, there will be a period of great tribulation during which the Antichrist, indwelt and controlled by Satan, will attempt to win supporters with false peace and supernatural signs. He will silence all that defy him by refusing to receive his mark on their right hands or forehead. This mark will be required to legally partake in the end-time economic system. Some futurists believe that the Antichrist will be assassinated halfway through the tribulation, being revived and indwelt by Satan. The Antichrist will continue on for three and a half years following this deadly wound. In 1590, Ribera pu uh, published a commentary on the Revelation as a counter-interpretation to the prevailing view among Protestants, which identified the papacy with the Antichrist. Ribera applied all of Revelation, but the earliest chapters, to the end time, rather than to the history of the Church. Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and would rebuild Jerusalem. Uh, that quote in particular comes from George Eldon Ladd in the Blessed Hope, a biblical study of the Second Advent and Rapture. Now, um, another quote here is, Ribera denied the Protestant scriptural Antichrist, that comes from Second Thessalonians 2, as seated in the Church of God. He set on an infidel Antichrist outside the Church of God. That quote is by Ralph Thompson. Uh, the result of his work, Ribera's work, was a twisting and maligning of prophetic truth, according to Robert Carino, uh, Carangola. So what I'm getting at with these quotes here is that basically 1,500 years of prophetic history 
was just swept under the proverbial rug. Uh, uh, and uh, how could that possibly happen? Well, you see, the Jesuits had added the infamous gap. They added something called the gap theory that teaches that when Rome fell in 70 AD, prophecy just stopped. And it would only continue again right around the time of the commonly held to secret rapture. Thus the ten horns, the little horn, the beast and the antichrist have nothing to do with Christians today. According to this viewpoint, absolutely no prophecies were fil fulfilled during the Dark Ages or during all these massively momentous occasions in man's history that have occurred and will continue to occur to occur until um, the dispensationalists and the arm, um, the um, uh, well, the papists, for instance, agree that the rapture will then, uh, the tribulation will then start at seven years, at the end of time. You can probably tell that I don't agree with that view by now. Now, the other two views concerning the eschatology of um, the Book of Revelation are the historicist view. Historicism is the belief that biblical prophecies about the little horn, the man of sin, the antichrist, the beast, and the Babylonian harlot of Revelation 17 all apply to the developing history and tribulations of Christianity, culminating at the end of time. Historicism sees these prophecies as having a direct application to papal Rome as a system whose doctrines are actually a denial of the New Testament message of free salvation by grace through simple faith in Jesus Christ, apart from works. Historicism was the primary prophetic viewpoint of the Protestant reformers. And, uh, I mean, it, just looking at the Wikipedia article um, of it, there, there's hardly anything about it when you're looking at the, uh, the Wikipedia article for the Book of Revelation, which I find to be <laughs> quite uh, amusing. Um, there's lots about the, the other two, but when it comes to historicism it says, well, no one really believes in this anymore. Maybe the Rastafarians or the Seventh-day Adventists or something like that. And the final view, the final way of interpreting the book of Revelation is called the, uh, the spiritual or the ideal view. Um, of course, this is um, so spiritual, but it, it believes that the book of Revelation is just very... Um, ethereal and it applies to every single day of our lives. I've heard descriptions of this view particularly from one liberal Anglican vicar who seemed to hold to this view because he didn't really have a good answer. Um, his actual answer was well let's just try and make the book of Revelation happen every day. At which point I thought this man clearly hasn't read the book of Revelation. Um, and of course this is all in spite of the fact that the book of Revelation says that it is a prophecy. They just choose to ignore that bit for convenience sake, I suppose. So of the three sensible interpretations of the Revelation, two of these have been developed by the Jesuits. They are corrupt fruit from a corrupt tree. And why were they developed? For the purpose of disguising the papacy from being identified as the Antichrist. The motivation behind them is not inspired by God's Holy Spirit, whichever way you examine the facts. This all sounds very familiar now. How could this possibly succeed, you might ask? Arminianism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits, and that's well taken over, you could say. Futurism fed to the Protestants by the Jesuits. Taken over, you could very well argue. The Puritan Thomas Brightman expressed uh, much the same around the year 1600. He writes, But mine anger and indignation burst out against the Jesuits, for when I had by chance light upon Ribera, who made a commentary on this same holy revelation, Is it even so? said I. Do the papists take heart again? So as that book which of a long time before they would scarce suffer any man to touch. They, doubt, they dare now take in hand to entreat fully upon. Now they dare be bold and dare to proclaim to the world.